refers to this thing in the novel. The old uh, Greeks had an idea of what that was. That was the idea of, of, the, of household, of how do you manage the resources of a household. Managing the resources of the society with the economic look at the resources of the society. Where should it go? How should it be distributed or not? Universe, we are, we are saying this economic has the universe of discourse and a discussion in it. What does it mean? It means there are various ways of looking at how you manage the economy. Various ways. For instance, you have Hindu economics. You have Gandhian economics. You know, these are all real disciplines. People actually study them. You have Buddhist economics. If anybody doesn't have references to any of these, ask me and I'll uh, direct you to books about all of these. You have Christian economics. And you have, of course, Jewish economics. And there are books, again, on, on all of these, many some in, in some cases, few in others. So all of these have a position on management of resources of a society. And because each of them has one, we've put together this <laughs> so all of them put together establishes a universe of discourse about how to manage resources of a society. Universe of discourse. In this universe of discourse, there are, as I said, meaning. You have, you have classical economics. You have neoclassical economics. And you have so many others within these two. Uh, we'll just say some, I won't mention it, you already are familiar with it. Now you have behavioral, econo behavioral economics, experimental economics, game theory, and all of the others that, that fit in here. It just fills it up if you, if you pick all of them and put it in here. In here, there is Islamic economics. And I put it in quotation marks because I want to look at it and see what does that this thing. Because every discipline here that fits in this universe of discourse has a explanation for its own existence. This is Christians, of course, this is Christian economics. They have a reason why such a discipline exists. So if I put Islamic economics here, and then ask, what do you mean by this? I don't mean just defining it uh, basically abstractly. Just look at it. What do we mean by this? We are saying, conceptually, we are saying, this is the way Islam tells us how the resources of a society ought to be managed. So you have Islamic but we have a problem, and I'll explain what this problem is. In order to do that, I give you the father and mother of Islamic economics within this universe of discourse. One is called uh, classical economics, the other one neoclassical economics. But rather than uh, starting just saying, oh, this is neoclassical economics, and then defining some, some things about it to distinguish it from classical economics, I want to do something different, which is never, which is not normally done, and say, where do these things come from? In other words, if you have a thought, you have to ask yourself, where does this thought come from? In graduate schools in economics, there is no, no explanation of the roots of these things called ontology. Don't worry about the terminology. It just says where that is, this being that is here, this phenomenon is here. Where did it come from? The other thing is, what do we know about this thing that we call epistemology? Again, I don't worry about this. This just says this phenomenon. What do I know about it, and how do I know about it? These are the simple questions. Big words. But that's all simply ontology. How did it come about? This one is how do I know, what do I know about it, and how do I, how do I know that? How did this knowledge come? 
So let's just start here. Where do they come? Every one of these things in here has an ideology, and that ideology comes from a philosophy underneath it. Why the philosophy? Here, philosophy is very, very bright, broad, but here, for our purposes, we say philosophy that we want to talk about is the one that only talks about ontology and epistemology of these things, of the elements of this universe of discourse. So what is the classical e e e economics ideology? Classical economics ideology is something called liberalism. What about this one? called neoliberalism, neoliberalism. And there's a major difference in, in, in this. this. This one, liberalism basically, fundamentally, talks about having in the individual freedom guarantee for everyone. And here, it simply meant that every, that every individual, again, I'm really taking a risk of oversimplifying everything. But here, it just simply says liberalism, that individual has enough freedom to do anything he or she wants to do with her or his resources, time, votes, whatever, that totally uh, unconstrained. So, so underneath this is something called individualism. What about philosophy? So, so we have ideology, ideology, and that ideology of classical economics is liberalism. And the, the place of performance or rendering this freedom to act for economics of the classical school is the market. So two things become very important for this idea. Is the first the freedom of the individual, secondly the marketplace. So the two takes the, the, they take supremacy over every other element of this philosophy of liberalism, this philosophy of, of that, that leads to ideology. So this fundamentally then what you have is liberalism becomes an ideology or a philosophy that gives that leads to ideology of individualism and market supremacy. The most important difference that we will see later with this is the, is the following. That in case of classical economics, the individual is free, but within a moral framework. <clears throat> now, they took Adam Smith wrote two books as you know, two famous, we actually three, one of them were put together, the third one was put together by his students after his death. There were lectures here called Lectures on Jewish Prudence. Jewish Prudence means what we call fiqh in Islam, right? Jewish Prudence. And first, he laid down, his first book was this Theory of Moral Sentiments. Theory of Moral Sentiments. They, they, anywhere in the world, in, in uh, graduate schools in Western world, or let's say Western Europe, or in the United States, they never talk about this. The second book of Fossil Wealth of Nations. What this thing did was lay down the moral framework, and basically, he was, he and people who followed him, had a philosophical thinking we call theism. Okay, theism is not the same thing as what we are either Christians or or the Jews or Muslims understand by monotheism. So you have monotheism, and even monotheism is broken down into many. Islam is a radical monotheism. Radical monotheism. Why radical? Because it's one and only, not only the uniqueness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
but all of the attributes that he has is not shared with anybody. Some of the attributes, of course, are reflected in humans. For instance, I don't know how many of you have studied Sufism. Sufism basically is the idea of inculcating in individuals the implications of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that this character building comes from this, this whole issue of becoming um, personally representative of the characteristic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-kareem, an individual learns to be kareem. And what the Sufi uh, uh, imams or, or, or Sufi leaders or, um, or you know, what, what we call the one that Murad and, and Sufis call it, the one that leads this, recognizes what the personality characteristics are that that have shortcomings. And the shortcomings are translated in terms of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you know, the, you know, the guy looks at you, very powerful psychologist looks look at you and say, here you have problem here, so here is the name, go there and repeat it enough so that you, you internalize it and it, it changes behavior. It changes characteristic strength that some weakens others and so on and so forth. So, but here's a difference is that, for example, if you look at the theory of moral sentiment, you can't decide what is this theo, what is this thing that he's following. Sometimes he calls it the author of nature, with capital, author of nature. Khalaq, yani, nature. I don't know if you can read this, but it's so small. Anyway, um, the author sometimes calls it God. Sometimes, oh no, there was five or six different titles he gives the state, the, the, the being that he believes in. And he believes that this, this being has given rules of behavior to individuals that collectively establish a moral character for people who would want to behave in the market and in the, in the economic system. When he produced the wealth of nations, he let this stand in the sense that he never refers to morality in the wealth of nations because he assumes there is difference between the timing of this publication of this one and this one is 16 years. He wrote this book and 16 years later he did the wealth of nations. Assuming that by in 16 years people have already absorbed this moral framework within which individual freedom was going to be exercised. So after him, Anybody who followed him, except, say, few. For instance, Ricardo stayed completely away with this, from this idea of talking about the moral framework within which economic behavior was supposed to take place. Others, however, didn't. Others kept up until very, let's say, well, my guess is about late um, 19th century. Uh, people talked about morality. American economists of early 20th century, they were all devoted to this idea that, that, that yes, you have freedom, yes, you have the market, but market has to be ruled and governed by morality, right? So neoclassical economics became something totally different from, uh, from the classical economics even though it has the, carries the word classical, it does so only because it emphasizes the liber liberty of individuals to behave in the marketplace, and market socially became supreme. Individually, the person who was going to act as an economic agent had all the freedom that it wanted, without interference from any place. Now, when you read the wealth of nations, as, not as much in, in, in theory of moral sentiments. The wealth of nations, he talks about the necessity of government or the state becoming involved when and if necessary. And he points out to various, various areas of economics that he believes that, um, that, that, that the state has a role to play. 
But these guys knew classical economics in the ideal ideology. Ideology of this is neoliberalism. And neoliberalism basically says no individual has absolute freedom. Market is supreme. Government has no role to play except to support the liberty of the individual and the working of the market. If there is any interference with the workings of the market, then the state has a responsibility and a duty to enter to make sure the barriers to individual behavior in the market is, is actually removed. Where does Islamic, the, the one in, in quotation mark come in, comes in somewhere in between. And how did that come about? You probably are somewhat old, but I'm, sh I'm young. I'm too old, but you're, you're young to know that there was a project during the late 70s, 80s, and the 90s, and, and traces of it are here. It's called was called Islamization. Islamization of knowledge, right? What it what it said was. A lot of the things, disciplines, sciences that have been developed in the West is fine. There are some contradictions between some of these sciences and Islamic belief. So our job is to go in these things, take out what is not Islamic, and replace it with what is Islamic. So that's what calls the Islamization project. So economics fell in that category. That is. People in the first generation of Muslim economists, second generation of Muslim economists, because they hadn't really done their homework, ended up grabbing hold of this idea of Islamization. They said, we take economics and then try to go in there and try to give it the uh, characteristics that Islam gives us about uh, how we have to behave in the marketplace in managing resources. The problem was the following, that this new classical economics operated with uh, axioms that were absolutely contradictory to the teachings of the Quran. Let's give some examples. Where were these? The first one was something called rationality. This is the first axiom. And what does it mean? I'll, I'll explain. But rationality was the first axiom of the neoclassical economics. And what did it mean? Neoclassical economists meant by rationality as reasoning, reason. And by that, they meant that person, if behaving during inter uh, transactional relationships with other people, behave the same way over and over again, the person was consistent, and that meant he's, he or she is rational. That's the extent of his rationality. In logic, has a very expansive meaning. But in this case, it's very restricted. So I give you one problem within the same. Uh, discussion. So supposing somebody out there, when you present them with a um, set of stimuli, he or she reacts a given way. Tomorrow or the day after, you also present, it with, present him or her with the same set of, of stimuli, the person reacts the way they did the day before. Now supposing there is somebody who doesn't do that. Day one, you offer them a set of stimuli, they react one way. Day two, you give them a, the same set of circumstances, the same set of stimuli, but they behave differently. Third day, they even behave differently from the second or first day. Is this person rational? New classical economics says no, they are not rational, they are irrational. But then you say, didn't you define rationality as consistency? You said yes. So this guy is consistently irrational because consistently is inconsistent, right? But every time we give him the same or her, the same set of stimuli, he behaves differently. So the person becomes 
rationally irrational. This is one problem within the axiom itself. But we have more serious problems with this. This is comes of a question. Why is it there anyway? First question. Why do you need this axiom? Remember, axioms are propositions that don't need to be proved, proven. Unproved axioms. But on the basis of that axiom, you build theories. And based on that theory, you either verify it or reject it. Logical positivism, as they say. So here, you so say, what do you need this axiom for? And these are the three fundamental axioms, meaning that there is no other way you can build this new classical theory without them. They're so fundamental. But why do you need it? This is why they need it. Because they want economics to resemble science. So scientific methodology to them meant that you observe the phenomena, and then you take data on that phenomena, you analyze that data, you explain the phenomena. Once you explain it, you can predict it. In other words, I can sit here, if a person reacts the same way to the same set of stimuli all the time, over and over again, meaning that he's rational or she's rational, I can now go and predict that if I, a year from now, I offer him or her the same set of stimuli, the person is going to react the same way. Once I'm able to predict, I can then control the person. Because then you can say, well, all I have to do is, is change the stimuli. I know what kind of behavior I'm going to get from this person. This was what was called scientific method, because in sciences, they did that. Except you're not dealing with a, with, with a chemical phenomenon or a physical phenomenon. You're dealing with a human being. And uh, human beings, one of the chief characteristics is they not necessarily behave. I'll give you an example. If we are all offered very low price on alcohol, who will buy it? We won't behave the way that this one says. If you, if you reduce price of anything, demand for it will increase. Not for us, anyway. And you can mention so many other things that are outside of this framework of thought for a lot of people. This is problems with this is that unfortunately it also leads to so many serious problems, especially in neoliberalism with this ideology that you basically have to leave people free so the powerful become free to use most of the resources of the society. So the second axiom of this is called self-interest. Now I'm sure you uh, inshallah, as you are listening, in your own mind, you must have found already problems with the first axiom. This one is even worse. What does the self-interest mean? Basically, it means that a person or a human being loves himself or herself, called the notion of self-love. It's a concept that, that has been around since the Greeks' time, that human beings love themselves. And this one says, because they love themselves, they behave in such a way to get maximum of their own interest satisfied. That's, that's self-interest. Meaning that if you talk in these terms, self means the one individual only. And this one individual has no concern for anybody else. There is no other regarding, no other regarding. So the person is assumed to focus on his or her own interest alone. The complexity and problems come with the third axiom called the scarcity. What does that mean? It means that you have means ends. They say that <clears throat> the resources that you have to satisfy the, the desires, quote unquote wants, the needs, all of these things are so many and resources are so few, scarce, is it enough? 
the so few that there is a problem in making decisions which one of these wants and desires and needs you're going to satisfy. If you are self-interested, and if you are rational, that means you're consistent, this means that what you do is make sure, because the scarcity is there, you make sure that you get the most you can personally for yourself to satisfy your self-interest. Implication, every time, everywhere, every place, you will try to get the most of what's available. And what you get, some person, another person doesn't get. That doesn't get. So this is called a zero, zero sum game. What I take, you don't take. What you take, I don't get. So what does this lead to? In order to satisfy this, we are in the same society. You and I are in the same place. You and I are facing the same problem. Not enough to go around. So what do I have to do? I have to compete with you in an adversarial position. I will never cooperate with anybody unless that cooperation means I can push my own self-interest down. In other words, get it to this point of, of having a zero-sum game. I, I, I only compete with you. I cannot cooperate with you. Because it's not, it doesn't fit here. Because if I cooperate with you and you end up with more than I, then I violated all of these rules on here. Because I'm not rational. If I give you something I have, it's a problem with rationality because I want from self-interest the most I can get from myself, so why should I give you anything? The result is a picture called model of man. I hate to use this word uh, man only because that really means human beings, model of man, but technically that's what they call it, model of man. The picture of this human being is one of greedy, acquisitive, competitive, and adversarially within the society. So the behavior is to take as much as you can. So the recent report is you have one individual with $130 billion of wealth. Please look at this number, $130 billion. One million dollars put up maybe two inches will cover all of this area of your university. Two inches, one million. So imagine one billion is a thousand millions and he has hundred and thirty billion dollars. On top and then FAO reports that thirty billion dollars will wipe out hunger in the world entire world, 30 billion. 2,000, according to Oxford, 2,153 billionaires in the world have more wealth than 5 billion people. And then we talk about scarcity. Logically, we have problems. There's another one. The assertion now is, according to studies, that if you take only the United States and Western Europe alone, the amount of waste, extravagance, opulence, that will wipe out poverty altogether. So it isn't the paucity of resources. Now, I haven't yet invoked anything from the slum. I just, from their own way of thinking, this is where we are heading. That was the result of, and you remember also that if I want, by, if I'm rational, I want the most I can get at the minimum cost. So what I do is free ride. If I have a chance to get what I want without paying the cost, fine, free ride. In addition to that, you have something called coordination problem. 
coordination problem. Why would I want to coordinate my plans with anybody? I'm competing with them. So you don't have any social coordination. You don't have social coordination. It wastes resources. It leads to something called the tragedy of the commons. Tragedy of the commons basically means if you have, you have a resource that belongs to everybody, and if everybody is rational, has self-interest, and is fearful of scarcity, what will they do? They basically destroy the common resources because they want to take and go. So pastures, for instance, that don't belong to anybody are ruined within a short period of less than a decade. That's called tragedy of comes. Waters. If you want to so to see a local example of tragedy of the commons, go downtown uh, Kuala Lumpur, that river, look how much junk there is. That's both free riding because I don't want to spend the energy to toss away my, my trash. And this belongs to the whole community. So the fact that you have so much pollution in there, and so much waste dumped in there, that also becomes a, a, a tragedy of the commons. So these are all problems that's created. Right now, you look environmental, and there is also this thing also called externality as well. Because you want to get the most out of everything as a, as a producer, want to maximize profit, that means you have to lower your cost, minimize your cost. And whatever cost you can pass on to somebody else, you will pass on in order to keep the level, level of, of cost low. So much of environmental disasters that we have is because of this ideology of neoliberalism and the economics of neoclassical. Where does Islamic economics, mean, there's a lot more we can say, but to save time, to say, where, where does Islamic economics stand? As I said, because we want to go in there and just simply take out things, and every one of these contradicts the Quran. How many people can see the contradictions? I won't ask for it. Yes, you can. So tell me. <laughs> you see, this one, I, I, I will say, because this, this whole notion of rationality, of reasoning, in, in order to be able to justify that people are rational in a sense of consistency, you look at every eye of the, 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 the your Quran's Verses regarding previous people. Their behavior is not consistent. Take the people of Shaib, for instance. What was the problem with the home of Shaib? These people wanted to constrict immigration. So what they used to do is have guards sitting at, uh, at the door entry into the city and wouldn't allow people to come in. So if you wanted to trade, they would trade right outside when you wanted people to come in. Well, and why? Because of course, you know, if they come in, they bring baraka with themselves, the Quranic term, baraka with themselves. They produce more. They make the society more prosperous. These are not in the Quran, but we, we have hadith enough about all of these people. What about Om and Lut? Why did they engage in an activity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no one before you guys had ever done this? Why did they do that? They were very popular. This is, again, has nothing to do with the Quran. The Quran says that they engaged in this particular. But why did they do that? What's the motivation for it? According to to history of what we know from the hadith and everything else, they were very prosperous people. They were worried that more children is going to cause them a reduction in their prosperity. This is at least, you know, the only documentation we have are hadith that, that we can rely on. 
So they were inconsistent because more children mean more labor, more labor would mean more production, more production would mean more prosperity, and the society's prosperity wouldn't decline because we have more children. So if you come to self-interest, the Quran and the Hadith of Rasulullah never contradict the idea that human beings have self-love. It is in fact fitri. It is part of the fitri structure of a human being, meaning that you have to love. Otherwise, why we do all the good things hoping that we get reward in the next world? What Islamic economics tells you, though, it says, oh, first on rationality, Islamic economics says there's nothing wrong with that, you know, being reasonable, because they translate rationality as being reasonable. That is, every time you're motivated to do something, it's based on a set of reasoning. And they didn't take it further to say, that's not what this new class is. It means consistency. consistency. But how many times you needed something for yourself and somebody else needed it, a family member, a friend, another Muslim brother or sister, needed it more than you did, how many times did you give it to them? I'm sure you can find at least one or two instances in your life that you have done just that. Not only that, but much more. Uh, when you really didn't have time to help anybody, but somebody needed help and you did it for them. That would be irrational. Why would you want to do that? Because you want the resources are scarce, time is scarce. So why would I, should I take time to help somebody else? I need my own money. Why should I help somebody else? So you're not rational. And you're not looking out after the self-interest. So right from the start, we create a problem for ourselves when we hang on to these notions that have this kind of, of logical structure in them. I will tell you what, at least from, from position of looking back and saying, what have we done to ourselves? What have we done to this discipline? Should we go further? And if so, what do we do? This idea that there is scarcity is absolutely against the Quran. Why? How many verses in the Quran that says, there is no scarcity? Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates everything, the qadar, meaning the exact specific measure that a generation needs of resources, Allah provides it. So it's not a paucity of resources. Therefore, the scarcity is violated by leaps and bounds, at least from the Quranic point of view. So if you drop these, all of them that. Let me just spend a little bit of time on this self. If you have, if, if we, we, we say that Islam approves, not only approves, but says it's part of the fetri structure of human beings that Allah has created to love themselves, then what is wrong with the self-interest? Islamic economics says nothing. You know, we're self-interested people. But they inter the interpretation of Islamic economics of the self-interest relies on the interest alone, meaning that it's to my interest, because it's my interest to have um, every reward I can get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worse, we can say we are the most self-interested, not selfish, most interested, uh, self-interested people in the world. Why? Because we want maradat Allah. There is nothing bigger than that. We want Allah to be happy with us. That makes us really self-interested. So you can see on the surface, this Muslim economists didn't have any problem to immediately accept this one. Because, oh yeah, that's true. The problem is with the self. The self of the Quran isn't just me. Why? The Quran says you have the same self. How do we know that? From which ayah? First ayah of Surah An Nisa. Appropriately put, the most important ayah as far as humanity is concerned. 
as far as this notion that um, you know Quran is misogynist and Muslims are misogynist, this is the, the, the idea that this is slap in the face of this this idea that says basically that you come from nafsin wahida. Please note, nafsin wahida. So is nafs masculine or feminine? I'm sure you all have to know some Arabic, right? <laughs> Most of you know it not. Is, is it feminine or masculine? Nafs. Feminine. So you come from a feminine, all of us. Wahalaka minha Zoja. Masculine or feminine? Hmm? No. Wahalaka minha Zoja. نفس الواحدة خلق منها زوجة. So زوج in this way, masculine or feminine? Masculine. So masculine comes from who? Feminine. So feminine is the reason we all exist. So is she inferior or superior? So. If we take this ayah not only in its own face value, but if we look at it deeply, it says we are all the same. All the same. In other words, we are myself expand over the entire humanity of seven billion people. The self. So my self-interest, and there are many, many ayahs in the Quran. Give you one quick example. The ayahs in, 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 in Surah 17 of the Quran. He says that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that if you do good, you do it to who? And ahsantum, ahsantum li amfusikum. But if I'm acting that affects another human being. Or nature, see, I will explain. That's also part of the whole creation, right? Nature is also part of myself. So if I do harm to another human being, Allah says, you have done it in ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusakum, wa in asatum fala. Meaning if you do good, well, if I do good, I'm doing it to somebody else, right? So you're doing it to yourself. So the other, there is no other. That's me. I heard that other, I'm hurting me. So in Islam, there is no word, there's no no concept of the other. It's just all of it, self. So if a person is going hungry, who is going hungry? The Quran says, you are. Maybe you don't know it, but you are. In this case, if you take this self-interest in its first meaning that is most that, that Islamic economics takes, you run contradictory to the Quran. If you accept the scarcity, you violate the Quran. You take rationality as consistency, you run against the Quran. So if everything is against the Quran, what is this Islamic economics? Like? This is just simply taking stock of where we are, you know, where do we go. The reason that this is a disaster, and I think as I said, mentioned is just a faint beginning after you know some God knows seven, eight hundred years of, of going the wrong direction. We find that we are not talking about Islamic economics at all or anything about economic management of society. All of a sudden, in the, in the 20th century, uh, at the end of the 20th century, 1975, 76, most of the economists have started talking about something called Islamic economics. So they had to come up with something, and they did an alhamdulillah wa shukra, that we now have a groundwork where we say, from here on, we are going to go further. But how do we go further? We know this isn't working. Why is it working? The biggest evidence is, as you know, finance, is embedded in an economy. So is Islamic finance a good thing or a bad thing? Has it done whatever everybody was expecting? 
Should I ask for a show of hands? How many people think it has? How many people think? But just to say it hasn't. But why hasn't? Why is Islamic finance is going in such a bad direction? Why is it not doing what it is supposed to? Because, because it came out of a mother called Islamic economics. So I'm to be blamed as a first generation of Muslim economist, Dr. Aslam, the second generation, <laughs> Dr. Maya, the third generation, you guys, fourth generation. So what we have to do is start thinking, what do I do with this fifth generation? What, what do I tell them? I mean, you sit there and talk about Islamic economics, and they hear, I mean, I have had so many students that have just dropped this whole idea of studying Islamic economics. It's better to just go and study traditional economics, because that's all I'm getting. So what do I do? Let's take five minutes break, and then so I can clean the board and stuff. <laughs> So if you have anything, if, if, if things are not clear, or if you think they were wrong, right, please let me know. So, because what we're going to start is the follow-up. Yes, please. Uh, see, thank you very much, Prof. Abbas, for the wonderful presentation. I think it is only you who could get more than 100 people on a Friday afternoon <laughs> to listen. It's Allah. <laughs> to, to listen to a discussion basically on the need to develop foundations and philosophy of Islamic economics, if I understood the main points. We need to have a serious discussion, debate, on and consensus building on the central concepts that form the foundations of Islamic economics. And I just want to share with you, we do have on Facebook uh, those who are following uh, this, uh, a group of us that uh, we, we, we call it Malaysian Islamic Economics Network. We've met a couple of times, colleagues from USIM, from uh, College University Islam Slamo, uh, UKM, um, and I think uh, one more university slips on mind. Uh, but when we, when we met, we all agreed that for this first six to eight months, we want to spend time focusing on developing a philosophy of Islamic economics. So really, I think today's session, um, you know, it just hits right on the, on the, you know, on the nail, and we look forward to the second 
<laughs> white boy to see what you have That's to say. I'm, I'm begging your indulgence with because if I say things that you may disagree with, but please let me know. Um, so, if if you believe that neoclassical economics, you as the students of uh, Islamic economics, if you believe neoclassical economics is wrong. It leads to disasters, which it has, and there are disasters. Another crisis is coming soon, and with it, it's going to eat up, destroy Islamic finance. So we have to go to back to square one and say, what do we do now? So if you believe in your classical economics, that <coughs> led to all of these disasters, you know, this huge obscene uh, income disparities. Uh, the very dangerous <coughs> developments of an environmental disasters that are really threatening uh, not only the existence of the economic system, but the ex existence of human the threat, the existential threat to humanity. And they all come from this thinking about new liberalism and new classical economics. Then we have to, I, I mean logically again, we have to agree that Islamic economics is not getting us where we have to go. How many people don't think that is true? Honestly, I mean, if you have any, any reservation, because we need that basis to move forward, the basis that we really need to change. We need to have what technically is called the paradigm shift. Anybody? Please. Yes, sir. Michael Prof. Yes, sir. Um, you, you just mentioned when I was about to ask you the question. I think the recent Davos, Davos uh, yes. conference yeah. uh, starts to address the issue of climate change yes. very, very seriously. Yes. And you have a guardian, an economist, and all that. I think it's over the last few issues, there's been about climate change as if that an existential threat to us. But if you look from what where you're coming from, on where the, the liberal economy is leading mankind, the, the three contradictions, in fact, violation of Quranic principles, the, the awareness of climate change has created four multi billionaires <coughs> China. In America, we have the very famous, what's his name? Elon, Elon Musk. Mm. Elon. Out of the misery of climate change, liberal economy is creating opportunities for more, more money. Yeah. More money making. Yeah, that's right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, so, but that's how you know who attends, of course, Davos, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the English. You know, yeah. if, if, if uh, Shaitan comes to you and says that, um, you know, I don't think you should do anything wrong, like he himself says, I, I keep telling people, people talk about tabloa, and tabloa means fearing Allah. I said that in the Quran, there is nowhere where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fear me. The only time 